and maybe I should start off by saying really what I'm going to talk about is the role of um, thermal densities on instabilities in the magnetosphere. What I've illustrated here is um, the growth rates and the resonant energies for electromagnetic instabilities between waves and particles in the radiation belts. And the only point I want to emphasize on this slide, well, there are two points I'd like to emphasize. First of all, that for electromagnetic instabilities, the resonant energies scale proportional to the magnetic energy per particle, b squared over 8 pi n. And therefore, the plasma density is going to come in in terms of the scaling of this energy. It's going to be important because we know that the spectrum of radiation belt particles falls off quite rapidly with increasing energy. And therefore, to a certain extent, high density plasma regions will lower the resonant energies and therefore produce a more viable instability. But you can't make the density is too large because you notice that the growth rates themselves scale in proportional to the number of resonant particles divided by the total plasma density. So if you make the plasma density too large, you're going to reduce the growth rates. Now what I've illustrated here is the, the value of b squared over 8 pi n, typically through an equatorial cross-section through the radiation belts. And you notice that it has a steep increase at the plasma pores, of course, where the density can decrease by a couple of orders of magnitude. Now, if you had a detached region out in the outer plasma sphere region, the resonant energies in this region would also be very low, probably in the order of uh, 10 keV or so. Now, last year at the Chapman Memorial Conference, uh, Coroniti put quite a considerable damper on a, on a theory which um, he, Cornwall, and myself had published about two or three years ago, in which we were talking about the instability of ring current protons during, the, during storm periods. What we had initially contemplated was that during a storm, ring current protons with energies, say, between 10 and 100 keV, would be injected into the night side of the magnetosphere. On gradient drifting around towards the day side, they would tend to intersect the plasma pores. And, and at the time, we thought that the outer zone region itself would be relatively stable. We now know that is not correct. But I still believe that instabilities along the plasma pores region can exist, and I'll try to show you an example where I think this is occurring. But during the recovery phase, one also expects the role of the plasma pores to come into play because we do know that the plasma densities will gradually increase um, in the region which was initially, uh, which was during the storm period, depleted of cold plasma density. And we had suggested at that time that this, this increase in the plasma density as the plasma pores moves back out could be a possible mechanism for the excitation of SAR arcs. Well, what Cornwall, uh, what Coroniti, Fredericks, and White have shown in a paper published approximately a year ago is that the outer zone itself can become unstable. It can become unstable to both um, an ion loss cone, electrostatic ion loss cone wave, and a high beta ion cyclotron electromagnetic wave. And if you plot the regions over which the instability can occur in, in parallel and perpendicular velocity space, you see that it, co it covers nearly all the entire region. So one would expect, indeed, the particles injected with very large anisotropies into the outer zone to be unstable to these instabilities. But once the anisotropies have been uh, <coughs> relaxed by the ensuing instabilities, one would expect the region outside of the plasma pores to become relatively stable. And it's then only possible to remove the ring current protons either by charge exchange or by ion cyclotron instability inside the plasma pores itself because the electrostatic instability doesn't work in regions where the density is high. What one should probably look for, because the main phase of the storm can be very strongly controlled by the, uh, by the source injection events, but during the recovery phase of the storm, the, the picture should be more, more easy to understand. And we have proposed, Cornwall, Coroniti, and myself, that during the recovery phase of the storm, strong ion cyclotron turbulence should be generated just within the plasma pores. This can then undergo Landau resonance with the thermal electrons of a few, few EV energy. And the, this would tend to heat up the electrons, and the heat could be conducted down towards the ionosphere to produce a red arc. Right. Another interesting thing is that one could begin to look at what would happen to the electrons due to similar instabilities between uh, Whistler mode waves at the plasma pores interface. Now, what one observes typically throughout the entire plasma sphere is a, is a hiss band, which has been termed plasmospheric hiss. It's a right-hand polarized electromagnetic wave with frequencies typically on the order of a few hundred hertz and a bandwidth also of a few hundred hertz. 
And what I've shown here is the variability of the amplitude of the 550 hertz channel of such a wave emissions observed on the OGO-6 satellite during a storm period. Here again was the onset of a magnetic storm. Now the interesting thing is that during the main phase of the storm, there, there, there is a pronounced uh, reduction, if anything, of the, of the plasmospheric Hiss emissions. One finds very little intensity at all, and this is probably very close to the threshold background value. But as soon as the recovery of the phase, as soon as the recovery phase of the storm begins, presumably when the plasma pore starts to move back out into the outer radiation belts and therefore begins to move into the region where the electrons have been injected, one finds a very pronounced intensification of, of waves in the 550 hertz channels, and in fact, it occurs over the entire band. And this enhancement of the wave energy can extend for several days after the storm period. Well, let me now turn to some aspects of detached plasma regions. This is a typical example taken from the Lockheed light ion mass spectrometer. You can see a well-defined plasma pause, um, and then as you move further out in the magnetosphere, you find a very structured region with densities rising from the normal trough densities between, well, less than, between 1 and 10 particles per cc up to densities approaching 80 or so. Now, one would expect that such detached plasma regions should be associated with enhanced wave turbulence. And here is an example of, <coughs> of what one, one sees during, uh, during a transit through a detached region in, of the uh, search coil magnetometer data. And one finds that in the 100 hertz channel, a very pronounced enhancement of the emissions, which seem to model very well the enhancements, even, even the fine structure of the enhancements in the plasma density. I well, I was going to say, who the hell is that, this guy, and where did he get this attitude? <laughs> but um, I'll let you speculate about the attitude, and uh, I want to share a few reminiscences that I have of how I got into the field and uh, what it was like to actually work at UCLA with these brilliant bunch of people that accumulated there in the early 70s. It all started for me in about 1965, <clears throat> when I was a graduate student, very impoverished one, at MIT. And um, I wasn't supported in the summer, so I had to find a summer job. And I applied to this place called Av Avco Everett. And I, I got a job with um, Charlie Kennel and mm -hmm. Harry Petrak, who had just uh, formulated and written their, their seminal paper on the stability, on the stabilization of the radiation belts by plasma waves. But <clears throat> they had a problem. Uh, although they saw the precipitating electrons that were caused by the, the stabilization process, no measurement of the wave was, was possible. We only had, at that point, point uh, wave measurements on very low-altitude satellites, and Gannett had flown these satellites and never seen the waves. So I was set the task of <clears throat> trying to understand why the waves were not present down at a thousand kilometer altitude. And what we did, uh, we developed, while I was there in, in 65, an analytical theory of how the waves propagate. We showed that as the waves go from the source region near the equator to higher latitude, they become oblique. And because they become oblique, two things could happen. First of all, they could get Lando damped. Or, if they get too high up on the field line, they can be what's called magnetospherically reflected once they <clears throat> the frequency drops below the lower hybrid frequency. And I think this was, this was the reason we gave for why you didn't see the waves on the engine satellites. So, uh, Charlie moved on, got a job at UCLA, and he found out that there was an opening position uh, in the Department of Meteorology. These were people studying weather. <laughs> and he recommended me for the job. And surprisingly, without even having an interview, they offered me a position. And I moved to UCLA in 68. <laughs> and I had to teach classes in really basic atmospheric science, things I'd never studied in my life. <laughs> but I did find a little bit of time to work with Charlie, uh, with Mike Cornwall, with Ferd Carniti, and with a student of mine, called Larry Lyons. Now, we knew um, <coughs> that the process of stable trapping worked in the outer magnetosphere, 
But when you come into the inner magnetosphere, the fluxes of electrons drop to almost zero. And yet, as shown on the video, we still see plasma waves in this region. So these waves were certainly not generated in the inner magnetosphere. They had to come from somewhere else. We didn't know in those days where they came from. But we did realize that as these waves propagate from the source region to other locations, they'll interact with a whole bunch of, elect of different energies. They could even in interact with different species. And so we started to develop the, uh, <coughs> the quasilinear theory, which is now even today used to formulate how rapidly um, particles in the radiation belts are scattered by plasma waves. So what I'm going to talk about today, and Lou's already uh, <laughs> developed, given, given you the title, I want to talk about some of the progress that we've made in the scattering. We're still going to use the, exactly the same formulation as was developed in the early 70s, but we have made some major improvements in the model.